In chapter 13, we'll take a look at viruses, viroids, and prions. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. What this means is that these viruses must absolutely enter a cell in order to cause the production of more virus. As they do so, ultimately they do damage or, or harm to that cell. Viruses are very simple. They basically contain DNA or RNA, some sort of genetic information. That genetic information could be single-stranded, double-stranded, linear, or circular. But the point is, they never contain both DNA or RNA at the same time. Also, viruses at minimum have to contain a protective protein coat, referred to as a capsid, but we'll define that in a later slide. Viruses really don't carry out any metabolic processes. They're not able to replicate, which is a form of viral reproduction, on their own, and they don't have motility. Ultimately, what they must do is once they enter the host cell, they must hijack it. They take over the host cell, and instead of the host cell accomplishing its normal metabolic functions, it begins to basically make the components necessary to form new virus. While a virus is outside of a cell, it is inert. But inside of the cell, as you can see here, it basically directs the activities that occur once it's hijacked that cell. We don't typically refer to viruses as organisms. We consider them to be non-living. So because of this fact, we usually refer to them as acellular infectious agents. They do require living organisms in order to be grown or, or rather to replicate. Ultimately, you can't grow them in a pure culture because there will always be another cell type present in addition to that particular virus. And as we'll get to a little bit later on, we'll mention that the viruses are very small. They're some of the smallest microbes that we have. Being so small means that they ultimately can't be seen with a light microscope. And although there are a multitude of ways in which you can classify viruses, many of them are typically classified based upon what type of cell they would infect, eukaryotic or prokaryotic cells. As I've said to you before, Viruses contain genetic information, and surrounding that genetic information is a protein coat. Viruses are known to infect just about every life form known on Earth. Ultimately, this means that they can infect large animals, such as an elephant, all the way down to small microscopic bacteria. In fact, the viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages, or just simply a phage. The phages are really useful for studying how viruses work. If you look at it, if you had an elephant-based virus, for example, it would be really difficult to study how that virus takes its toll on an elephant. Why? Because elephants are really large, take up a lot of space, and can be costly to maintain, obviously. Ultimately, if you have a similar virus that works on a bacterium, i.e. a phage, the mechanisms of infection, the processes that are carried out by the phage, could be similar to those that are carried out by the elephant virus. It's much easier to study the phage because it infects the bacterium, which is microscopic. It's smaller, less expensive to maintain, and typically it also causes, or rather the processes that play out occur much quicker. So the phages are very useful from a research standpoint, all because of their efficiency and economic, uh, economic uh, cost efficiency. They are, the phages that is, excellent vehicles for horizontal gene transfer. I'd refer you back to chapter 8 if you don't remember what horizontal gene transfer is, but that's simply the transfer of genetic information from one bacterial cell to the next, not from a, one bacterial cell to an offspring or daughter cell. Ultimately, their ability, the ability of the phages to kill bacteria is important. Without them, our environment will be so overrun with bacteria that it could cause serious implications for not only humans, but all life. As I mentioned to you before, we do want to say a few words here about the size of viruses. Ultimately, I'm not concerned with you memorizing the exact numbers. The thing that I really want you to appreciate as I go to the next slide here is that viruses are some of the smallest microbes, as I've said before. If you look, the viruses, the poliovirus, hepatinovirus, adenovirus and there's multiple others you see here in red are all smaller than the bacterial cell represented by the E. coli 
and the bacterial cell is even smaller than a human red blood cell which you see depicted over here on the left hand side. So I'd like for you to appreciate the difference in size. Yes, we've talked before previously about how prokaryotic cells are typically smaller and less complex than eukaryotic cells. You get an indication of that as you see the E. coli prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic red blood cell here. But if you were ever asked to rank the size, the viruses are going to be smaller. It somewhat makes sense. If a virus must enter a whole cell in order to ultimately be able to t hijack it and also ultimately replicate the virus, well, that means the virus has to be smaller than the whole cell that it's going to infect. So multiple viruses here, but the key thing is viruses are smallest, prokaryotic cells will be next in size, followed by the eukaryotic cells. So let's talk a little bit now about viral architecture. A complete viral particle is known as a virion. That consists of the genetic information of the virus surrounded by its protein coat, which as I told you before, we mentioned again, and that protein coat is called a capsid. The capsid is composed of multiple subunits, and each individual subunit is referred to as a capsomer. If you combine the capsid and the nucleic acid, the genetic information of that particular virus is referred to as a nucleocapsid. Now, as I said to you several times already, a virus can contain DNA or RNA, but never both. And it can occur in multiple forms, single-stranded, double-stranded, linear, circular, multitude of options. But these viruses can have other components in addition to the nuclear capsid. Some viruses actually have a, a biological membrane that surrounds them, very similar to a phospholipid bilayer. If that virus contains that that lipid bilayer surrounding it, we call it an enveloped virus. You see an example of an enveloped virus down here in the lower right hand corner. Sometimes a virus doesn't have an envelope. If it does not have an envelope, it's referred to as a non-enveloped virus or simply a naked virus. And you can see that depiction here on the right hand side. Regardless of which viral type you consider, you can typically see that the virus will have spikes on its surface. Here are some of the spikes associated with the naked virus. You can see the spikes here covering the envelope of the enveloped virus. The spikes are usually used as attachment. One of the ways for viruses to enter a whole cell is called adsorption. And in order to be adsorbed, the virus must attach itself to the membrane or the cell wall of the host cell. The spikes aid in that process. The nucleocapsid and its capsomers ultimately lead to three major shapes associated with viral architecture. You can have the icosahedral shape, which from a microscopic point of view somewhat looks circular, but it's tip technically composed of 20 flattened triangles, as you can see here on the right hand side, all arranged into an icosahedral shape. The next basic viral shape would be helical. In this situation, the, hel the uh, capsomers are arranged into a helix. So if you look over here on the right hand side, you see kind of the ring like structures stacked one on top of another. This is actually one long series of capsomers arranged very tightly into what would, well, kind of technically be considered a spiral staircase type arrangement. Finally, you have the complex shape. The complex shape doesn't fit into the helical or icosahedral categories. The complex shape is illustrated by a phage. This is a T4 phage that you see over on the right hand side. The T4 phage has a head unit which has an icosahedral shape, but then the foundation of its tail component is actually helical. So it's not a helical exclusively or icosahedral exclusively, it's kind of both. So for that reason, the T4 phage is referred to as a complex architecture. You can see it also has a base plate, which will become important in a little bit, in the latter discussion rather. And then you can see the tail fibers, which contain the spikes, which would aid in absorption, as, we, as I just mentioned to you a moment ago. Viral taxonomy can be quite complex. Viral taxonomy is, revolves, excuse me, around multiple principles. If you look at it, most viral families end in the suffix viridae. But once again, they really follow no consistent pattern. 
you can see some viruses are named for their appearance, such as Corona Viridae because they look like a crown. Or they can be named for where they're discovered, such as Bunia Viridae for being discovered in Africa. The genus name of a virus typically ends in virus. This one's a little bit more straightforward, enterovirus. And then the species name is what we often refer to a particular virus by. For example, you saw earlier poliovirus. That's actually the species name, and it's actually named for the disease that it caused, which is poliomyelitis. Don't see it too much commonly anymore because we typically vaccinate for polio at an early age, and, well, it's not very common. But as you can see, the nomenclature system here for viruses is somewhat sporadic. A lot of viruses are often referred to informally typically being grouped together upon how they're able to cause infection. In other words, the route of infection. I want to go to the next slide, which shows you the table. And my, what I would ask you to focus on is the viral group, along with its mechanism of transmission. You'll see examples over here on the right-hand side. Enteric viruses, well, the root here comes from intestine. And if you think about the intestine, well, especially the large intestine, there's fecal material. So enteric viruses are those that are passed via the fecal or route. Typically this means that a person drinks contaminated water or they may consume contaminated food. Um, common ways that this could happen for a, a human being at least, uh, if you are in an area where the water supply is contaminated obviously typically by animal fecal material, you could acquire an enteric virus. And also um, if you look at Little kids, a lot of times, they usually go and when they use the restroom, they may not wash their hands fully, and if they don't, they may pick up an enteric virus via that fecal oil route, maybe having some fecal material still on their hands, for instance. The respiratory viruses are, are rather acquired via respiratory or salivary route, essentially being the respiratory system. So usually if you're around individuals who have some type of respiratory viral um, syndrome occurring, and they call for sneeze, small droplets of water are expelled into the air. And when that occurs, you may inhale them and acquire a virus via the respiratory route. Sexually transmitted viruses, I don't think that requires much explanation, but they are typically acquired via sexual contact. Zoonotic viruses, along with the um, two different manners, rather, excuse me, of being acquired. It could be one that's passed from an animal to a human directly. You see the example of rabies and cowpox. Um, if you think about rabies, if you look at a rabid animal, it might bite a human being, most commonly being a bat, something like that. And that bite, the, the once bit, rather, that would transfer the virus from that infected animal to a human. And then you could also look at the vector-borne viruses. Vector-borne viruses are usually transmitted via an arthropod, something like a flea or a tick or a mosquito. And there's a multitude of encephalopathies that are that can be caused. Obviously, one that you can see over on the right-hand side that's more common to southeast Louisiana would be one such as West Nile encephalitis. So um, these are the route. These are rather several um, viral groups based upon the route of transmission. Like I said, definitely you want to focus on the viral group along with the means for transmission of that particular group. This slide just kind of recaps a lot of what I just mentioned in the previous uh, table slide there. Um, we mentioned the oral, fecal oral route for enteric viruses, the respiratory route for those uh, respiratory viruses. The zoonotic viruses always animal to human. And then you can see the arthropod, which would be another zoonotic-based uh, uh, viral transmission here as well. With this, we'll end this particular lecture.